Hello guys, uh, welcome to Viking Conquest, the ultimate guide, another one of my guides. I will, presenting, I will be presenting the Viking Conquest DLC in depth with uh, talking about all of the top, uh, all of the tacos, all of the things, units, builds, um, weapons, best weapons, how to conquer, how to win, how to make a kingdom, all of that. All of the topics will be uh, with timestamps in the description below under the video so if you want to skip to a certain topic please do so it won't be a problem so just to give you guys a general idea of what we have on the map uh viking conquest is one of the more grindier dlcs so you will have a hard time conquering the world uh right now i've started my kingdom from dorstad we have the kingdom of bertania let me show you inside the faction section kingdom of bertania it is mine i it's ruled by me revol and i'm gonna be talking about each aspect currently i'm conquering freeze it's a good place to start from um frisians don't have the strongest units so it's a good idea to take them first uh yo isaac dog welcome back to the end yes i do have finally a kingdom uh but as you can see it's a huge world one of the biggest uh, mountain blade maps that I've seen in mods and DLCs. So I thought, you know what? It's okay. I got to the kingdom stage. I can explain to you guys what to do from here and it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so first of all, we will go ahead and tack uh, and talk. Sorry, not attack. What the fuck? We will go ahead and talk about the best character build for your character. And one of the things that you need to keep in mind with this mod is that strength is king um sorry it has a very very difficult a very difficult um campaign i'm gonna go sandbox now i just want to show you guys um what builds do you need to go strength is king uh if you're not good at combat you will most likely be losing most of the battles uh even if you control um your troops very very well it's not gonna work very good in your favor anyway uh, these are the difficulty options which we're going to be talking at the end of the video so if you want to talk if you want to check the difficulty settings um check the topic but right now i wish to go inside the game and talk about what are the best builds and i found two builds for the game um one of the builds is the noble raider build this has the maximum amount of strength that you can acquire and it's also one of the most rounded characters you know so not just pump up strength like an idiot um this also has strength and some decent stats in the other departments um you will be of noble line and depending on your religion um you will Depending on your religion, you will be able to decide if you want to go the Raider route or simply the Noble Warrior route. Uh, with the Noble build, I actually recommend that you go the, with the Raider route. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, um, Ethnicity. So this is the first build, the Noble Combat build. For Ethnicity, you will need to go Norse. That will increase your strength. Uh, gender, male or female, it really doesn't matter. I recommend male. It gives you more strength. Height, uh, go with tall. Age, you want to go uh, young. Personality, sanguine. Greatest virtue, fortitude. And then your father's occupation, he was a noble. What you learned as a child were crafts. And then uh, vocation and religion really don't matter on stats. Um, vocation simply decides your starting gear. I think if you want the most money, uh, go with landowner. And then religion, this will determine um, what monasteries and what kingdoms you'll be able to attack without receiving a lot of penalties. So if you're a Christian, you can attack uh, pagan monasteries, pagan locations without receiving a penalty boost. Uh, penalty, um, sorry. A penalty to relations and if you are pagan you can just roam and raid and pillage and plunder to your heart's content uh, monastery wise because there are a lot more mon uh, christian monasteries than pagan uh, religious locations 
So we're just going to go with that one. I'm going to press continue. Uh, because, as I said, this is a noble start. You can select your banner, go with whatever. Let me take with without saving. And now, for, from this case, you can go full into strength. I don't recommend you go beyond 21. Uh, the most heavy strength required weapon is a troll's axe, and that requires strength 21. So it's your decision if you want to go from level 1 with strength 21, or if you want to invest in certain area in certain other stats. I would say you go into intellect until 8, and by level... Let me just let me check. Um, so six, eleven, sixteen. By level sixteen, you will have the strength requirement to utilize the troll's axe if you so desire. Hello, hello, music. Uh, welcome back to the end, dude. Creating the guide for Viking conquest right now. Um, I prefer to just go into intellect because it gives me a lot more skill points to play around with. Uh, you will have a lot of skill points each level up. You will receive two skill points. So I'm, I'm going to talk about level up a little bit after we go through the builds. So from here, I recommend that you put a point, two points into Seeking. Uh, max out Power Strike. Well, while you level. And then I recommend that you have some points into Pathfinding. And Persuasion is looking good. Leadership is looking good. This also gives you a very, very good leadership boost early in the levels uh, but we'll talk about that actually no i can talk about that right now leadership stacks yes so in viking conquest the leadership stat stacks with your companions so it's it, it's exactly like trainer in the other mods um so leadership will stack will provide you with troops um with extra troops so have leadership and on as many companions as possible okay as many companions as possible. Um, other, th other, other small changes. Uh, you can see Seeking over here. It'll simply uh, give you your fleet size. Your fleet size. So how many? Um, I'm not sure about the wage reduction. Hello, music. Um, but I do know that the troop size, the part, the army size, does stack with that. I doubt the wage. It also reduces wages. So for Seeking, it simply tells you how many uh, ships you can have in your fleet. Uh, this is not stackable, so you will want to have on your main character at least a few points. I feel like two points is okay. If you get the biggest ships, which are 90, uh, 90 troops, you can fit 90 troops in the biggest ships, and have three of them, you're going to be A-okay. I mean, you're going to have 270 troops on your boats so with that with that force size you can conquer almost anything so you don't have to worry about that uh navigation this is a party skill it increases your uh, sea speed then you find it very useful but you can make one of your companions to use it and then iron flesh power strike um i actually this is one of the few mods that I actually recommend that you spec into iron flesh uh, make yourself as tanky as possible because combat it's is very difficult in Viking Conquest. Keep that in mind. Weapon maintenance is another new thing. This will uh, reduce the probability of your weapon breaking during fights. Again, this is a stat that you can uh, put one of your party members to spec into. But because we went with the Noble Warrior build here, we have um, four weapon maintenance, which is very good for the early, early game until you find a companion who can provide this with to you. Athletics, another thing that I recommend that you spec into because in the early game, you will be on foot. You won't have a horse. So keep that in mind. Uh, looting, you'll have a companion who specs into this, so not a lot of things. I don't recommend that you spec your personal character into it, only if you have the extra skill points. And then we get to Trainer, which is, again, a little bit different from the other mods. Trainer can only go to a maximum amount of 5. So you can't go beyond Trainer 5. That's why I recommend, as you level up your character, uh, put 2 extra points into Intellect to have Intellect 10, so you can reach Trainer 5. That's all. That's all you need to go for. Uh, since we will have a lot of troops uh, passively from our companions... I don't recommend that you spec into Charisma. Uh, just put the strength requirement that you wish to have. 
uh, then put extra points in uh, to reach 10 intellect, and then from there, you can do whatever you want with the extra attribute points. But but by, by that point, you won't have a lot of attribute points to play around with, because in Viking Conquest, it, the leveling system is a little bit different. You receive one attribute point every five levels. Every five levels. That's why character creation and the decisions you make at the beginning of the game for your character is one of the most important aspects. It's it's the thing that can make or break your playthrough. Make or break your playthrough. I'm not kidding. Uh, let me go through the rest of them. So think of it like this. The next attribute point that I'm going to be receiving will be at level 6, and then another at level 11, ele uh, level 16, level 21, level 26. So from 5 into 5 levels, you'll receive an attribute point. And to compensate for that, at level 2, you will receive 2 skill points instead of just 1. So it's like having an extra point into intellect. Also, um, to further diminish uh, the... Um, the skill limits, the skill thresholds, uh, you only need to have a maximum of 20 strength to spec into one of the strength skills up to 10, a maximum of 20 agility to spec to one of the agility skills up to 10, and so on and so forth for the intellect and charisma too. So um, with intellect 10, I can bring all the intellect uh, skills up to 5. Okay, you don't need to have... Uh, in, in normal mods, you would usually need to have... Um, to bring it up to 5 or 3, you need 15. You need 15 intellects to bring them up to 5 in other mods. But in this one, you can just stack it up. So right now, we have 8. I can bring the uh, pathfinding up to 4, if I so wish. Oh, sorry. No, that's an agility based. Uh, my bad. Never mind. I can bring up uh, surgery up to 4, you know. When usually, if you have intellect nine, you can only bring it up to three. Okay, I hope I hope it's it's a little bit uh, confusing, but if you just read the descriptions of each stat, it will tell you it can go beyond half of the agility that you have. Okay, um, so we were talking about trainer. This only stacks up to five. Put trainer on as many of your companions as possible. Bring it up to five on everyone, and you will be able to uh, promote your troops to upgrade your troops as much as possible and faster. Um, another thing about trainer, uh, try to focus the, on this stat in the late game. You don't necessarily have to have it right now, okay? You don't necessarily have to have it right now, so as you level up, you'll be able to put skills into the trainer. I recommend that you bring trainer up to level five, once you have it to like 10, and you're going to be good to go. In the early game, it's not going to help you too much. Uh, tracking works the same way. Tactics work the same way. Pathfinding works the same way. Spotting works the same way. Inventory management is now a strength stat. Yo, this is William. Welcome back to the end, dude. Uh, inventory management is a strength stat, and this will, will simply be determined about your strength. But since with this build... Uh, yo dude, thank you for becoming a follower. Welcome to Hit Point In. My name is Revol. I'll be your bartender, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Drinks are on me. Um, with this build, you will be able to have up to 10 inventory management, and, <coughs> well, in this case, since we have strength 18, you can upgrade this up to 9. Like, you don't give a fuck. <coughs> I recommend that you have as much inventory management as possible in Viking Conquest, because it's very lucrative to go for trades, for trading routes. <coughs> and I'm going to give you a guide on trade routes as well. Let me just drink some water first. Okay, uh, wound treatment, surgery, and first aid works the same way. Engineering works the same way. Persuasion works the same. Leadership, as I said, it stacks and trade very good stat to invest in if you want to go for a merchant build and i'm going to talk you to you about the merchant build in a second again fucking awesome it's very very worth it to go for trading in viking conquest okay so for this one i would say go a, with a lot of points into power strike make even bringing that to nine and then make sure you have some pathfinding in the early game it's very useful uh, you don't have the prisoner management. As you can see, there is no prisoner management set anymore. Um, you can grab prisoners based on 
how how large your army is, how large your party is. Um, if if I recall correctly, I have an um, army of two hundred and seventy. I think I can grab around seventy troops. So that seems to be cool. Anyway, um, the last point I'd say go. You don't need to focus on surgery because you will be able to find a companion who will do all of your surgery for you. You can bring that as you increase your level. You can bring this up to level five uh, because of your intellect. Um, put some extra points into ath athletics. Okay, let's uh, do that. And done. Sure, whatever face. Continue. Blah, blah. And now let me show you the other build. Uh, this is the commoner merchant build. And this one is amazeballs. This is actually my favorite build. I don't like the, the noble build that much. But I love the commoner merchant build because I love trading in this game. Uh, let me show it to you. Go back to sandbox. Again, we're going to talk about the difficulty options at the end of the video. Um, so, this build is the most stats you can get from the choices. And interestingly enough, the most stats you can get from the choices is also a very viable merchant build. So, for ethnicity, we go again Norse. Uh, the reason I'm saying Norse, um, ethnicity only determines what initial, what initial stat you receive. So Norse will give you strength, um, Pictish, uh, Scotto Picts will give you agility and so on and so forth. I do recommend that you go with Norse, get that strength, gives you a lot of, uh, because strength is king in Viking conquest. Uh, male, height, go for tall. Um, age, this time adult. Personality, you want to go choleric. Greatest virtue, go justice. Father's occupation, you want to go merchant. Learned while a child, you want to go oratory. Vocation, again, doesn't matter. Vocation only determines what's your starting gear. Go land, I can go and landowner. And then for religion, if you're a merchant, you will not be raiding. So I actually recommend that you go with Christian. Um, but both are viable, both are okay, as long as you don't raid. Yes, hello music. You do get shit ton of riches. Okay, so continue. Allow me to quit without saving. And uh, looking at the stats, I actually recommend that you round things up. Put one point into each and you have one of the best rounded characters in the game this is the perfect character build if you go for sandbox mode if you go for sandbox mode hear me out hear me out um it's it's not necessarily a spoiler uh but in campaign mode i actually recommend you to go with the noble warrior build the first build that i recommended because um early in the pl early in the campaign you will be able to acquire your trader and your medic so you don't necessarily need those stats early game so you can go with the noble warrior build but if you're in sandbox mode where you're just in central britain and you don't have your um medic with you until you find her in one of the taverns i recommend that you go with the merchant build this helps you gives you a trade seven stat which is amazing because with trade seven you also receive a extra bonus of plus two because you have um above six if you had trade eight you would receive a bonus of plus three but anyway starting from level one with trade nine is amazing simply fucking amazing uh for the extra skill points as you can see you have a lot of extra skill points that you can go for um put two points into seeking navigation is okay bring power strike up yeah bring power strike up to five you'll need that shit uh you need to find a companion who uh has decent weapon maintenance. I don't recommend that you spec your main character into weapon maintenance. It's a waste of skills. And if you find somebody who has six weapon maintenance, your your weapon will have a very, very small chance of breaking during fights. So you're good to go on that end. Um, other things that I recommend that you spec into go persuasion, go leadership. And from there, you, always, you already have some pathfinding. You have decent athletics, deep, decent weapon master. You will need to spec into writing if you wish to go the, right, the writer route. But early game, it's very hard to find a decent horse because they're very expensive. So just 
try to keep athletics up a bit okay so this is the merchant build one i think amongst the two this is the better build especially since most of you will play sandbox mode um you could i also i finished the campaign mode with this build it was still doable it was still super fun and if you really want to use the trolls axe uh by level 26 wait am i saying that right i think yeah yeah by level 26 you will have enough attribute points to put into strength uh to go for the troll axe if you want anyway you will be making a shit ton of money with this build and we're going to be talking about more on that a little bit later Okay, so those are the builds we start in Norway because of our ethnicity. Let's quit without saving and let's go to my character, show you how my character currently looks like. We are, my bad, on day 422. And my character is level 29. And this is the merchant build. This is the merchant build, the second one that I've shown you. And I did exactly that because I wanted to use the troll axe. I pumped everything into strength. As you can see, I have uh, strength 21 by level 26. And I spec'd into Iron Flesh, uh, Power Strike as much as possible. I have Inventory Management 10. Um, persuasion on Leadership as much as Charisma can, per um, can permit. Trade, as you can see, I didn't put an extra point in a trade because everything was gucci i had trade from level one you don't need more than that i spec a little bit extra into surgery just to help out my medic uh pathfinding to help out my pathfinder uh looting just because i had the extra skill points trainer up to five because that's the maximum as you can see at learning limit you can go beyond that and um because so athletics is i actually have athletics six but because i have heavy armor on myself it brings my athletics down to one and that's why i specced in the late game into riding so right now i'm a rider as you can see i have a horse uh this is okay so for horses you don't have a lot of choice you can either go for a horse which is very good or a pony ponies are smaller weaker slower they're practically the donkeys from forest if you play that if you play that mod uh but yeah the horse is around 9k in the shop uh so you need a little bit of extra investment but all's good on that end um looking at the armor we'll talk about the armor and best weapons and best gear when, when once we get to that section um but i wanted to show you guys the troll axe the troll axe requires 21 strength and has 50 cutting damage. It's one of the best weapons in the game, but it can't be used on horseback. So if you want to go for a foot foot soldier build, the troll axe is the weapon for you. I keep it because if my horse falls in battle, I'm going to bring out the troll axe and murder people left and right. Okay, now that was it for the build. As I told you, uh, you have the noble warrior slash raider build or the merchant the commoner merchant build that you can go for uh, personally i love the merchant build uh, but if you play the campaign go for the noble warrior slash raider build if you play sandbox i recommend the merchant build more because it helps you a lot more a lot more in the early game okay uh next topic let's see next topic we're going to be talking about is companions and stable parties okay so in my other guys i usually explained um two parties first party you gather the companions that you want you want them to become your nobles later on and then the second party your permanent characters in viking conquest i don't recommend to make uh that you make your companions into nobles because you will make a lot of friends a lot of relations uh, as the game goes on and you're not gonna need companions as nobles so i'm just gonna tell you the stable party that i found and then tell you exactly how to level up certain characters so the stable party that i found are the following companions again um, you should either write this down or you know save the video or something uh agathanos i'll chew Asbjorn, Bodo, Brunhild, Kayo, Clovis, Donchad, Morgant, and Solveig. 
this is the stable party that I found. Uh, some of them will hate each other from uh, here and there, but once you have all of these party members, it will stabilize and they won't want to run away anymore. Okay, uh, hello Cryptic, welcome to the end, good sir. Welcome to the end. I'm creating a Viking Conquest guide right now. Okay, so that is the stable party. Um, now, I need to talk with you guys about leveling up companions. And you don't have to level them up that much because they already come with some amazing, amazing stats early on. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about Brunhild. Brunhild is your medic. Uh, best medic in the game, in my opinion. She already has a high amount of intellect, and you can bring that up to... Because she has intellect 16 in this case, you can bring that up to 8. Um, don't invest any attribute points in anything else except intellect. Bring this as big as and as much as possible until, until intellect 20, of course. Once she has intellect 20, you don't need to go beyond that. Uh, because once you have intellect 20, you will have 10 into surgery, 10 into wound treatment, and 10 into first aid. For equipment, I just equip them with the best armor in the game. Uh, well, best armor that I can find. Give them, a, give them a Pictish crossbow, which you can acquire from the Scottish territories in the north. <laughs> Pardon. And put them in the back line, put them in the archer division, and don't let them battle. Keep them behind. Keep them behind, keep them safe, just to keep that surgery going. Okay, let's see. Uh, Gathanos. Uh, Gathanos, my boy here. Now I'm just talking about the specialized companions that are very, very useful. Uh, Gathanos is your engineer. Uh, he is fucking amazing. Again, a lot of intellect. Uh, I expect him into engineer. Oh, actually, he starts off at Engineer 9 and Tactics 9 and Weapon Maintenance 9. So he's insane like that. You, I also expect him to become my Navigator. So he has Navigation 9. This is an intellect skill. And in case Brunhild goes down, I also expect him into Surgery. Just because he had the extra skill points. Uh, Build-wise, again, Heaviest Armor with a Crossbow, Sword and Board in the back line. And... Try to keep him safe as much as possible. Very, very good character. Now, let me check exactly what other characters do I have around here. Okay, we have Morgant. So, Morgant is my lure guy. Again, he starts off with looting 9. So, as you find him, you find him with looting 9. Fucking amazing. Good agility character. Um, so, keep him around and you will be able to find a lot of riches during warfare. Let's see, anybody else? Kayo, uh, Kayo, I spec'd him into being my Pathfinder at Tracker. So, as you can see, he's Pathfinding 9, Spotting 9. Uh, sadly, Tracking is an intellect stat, so if you want to have Tracking, it's, it's not that vital, it's not that vital of a skill. But if you want Tracking, you will want a character with high intellect like Agathanos if you want to spec into Tracking. No big deal. It's still pretty fucking good. And as you can see, Kayo can be a secondary character. You can, you can spec into looting. You can bring that up to 9. And if I reach with Kayo level 21, I will have 20 into agility. So these will become 10 pretty soon. No fucks given. No fucks given. Okay, let's see. A tracking is from Donchad. I spec him into it because he had a decent intellect skill. But again, you would prefer to go with Brunhild or Agathanos into tracking, if you so desire. I feel like tracking 7 is more than enough, and I don't need more than that. And trading, I'm still a trader. I trade around, and I don't feel like you need any trading beyond 7, so all's good on that end. Uh, of course, don't forget to grab as many companions as possible, not just the stable party, just so you can send them to gather right to rule in the early game. Yes, right to rule is still a thing in the Viking Conquest, and you want of it, as much as possible of it as you can. So that's it for leveling companions. Um, for those who you want to keep, keep them in the front line, give them a sword and a spear. As infantry, Clovis is one of the only... Uh, combat companions that I have as you can see he has monster combat stats um, and you can further upgrade this 
as you increase his level. And that's pretty much it. Give him a sword and board and put him in the front line if you want to use him like that. Or you can also give them mounts and use them as, you know, your immortal cavalry, if so you wish, if you so desire. You know, if it's possible to convince a lord to rebel with you, you always cause discord between a powerful lord and king, and then try to convince him to make you king instead. Uh, not Shadow, welcome to the end, good sir. If you want to do that, if you want to do that, make sure that you have a shit ton of persuasion. Uh, maybe even go beyond persuasion six, seriously speaking. Uh, it's very, very hard to persuade people to r join you. It's much easier to just go ahead and create your own kingdom, like I did. I just conquered Dorstad, and then from there... Uh, grab another castle. I grabbed Kenimer, and I'm I did not assign Kenimer to me And now I'm waiting for uh, nobles to join my side to join me at Dorstad And then I'm gonna hire them and assign them So I recommend against it, but hey you do you my man you do you Okay, the next oh Yes, okay. The next uh, topic we're gonna be discussing will be best troops Okay, so uh for best troops, it's going to be a um, weird one. But before we get into the troops, I just want to tell, remind you guys that the maximum, amount, the maximum amount of trainer that you can get is 5 on all the characters, including your own. So I know right now I have intellect 10, and you can't see that, but let me, let me go on a character that has beyond intellect 10. Okay, uh, she has intellect 16, so I should bring the trainer up to 8. It doesn't go beyond... Okay, so in this case, it's just 2. But trust me, it doesn't go beyond 5. I was surprised too when I found out it's kind of shitty, but it does not go beyond 5. Okay, yeah, here's a good example. Intellect 19, and I can't go beyond 5. Okay, um, now, best troops. And there's a lot to choose from. There's a lot to choose from. So, uh, first of all, if you go to the camp section, you have the troop trees available. So you can check all of the troops you want. No biggie. We're going to go through each one of them. Uh, tell them their strengths. Tell them their weaknesses. And then at the end, I will, t I will give you the top best troops all around. Okay? So, let's go with the factions first. Uh, Norse Friedman. The Norse specialize into, um, they simply specialize into infantry units. Uh, forget the standard bearer, don't go for him. He simply comes equipped with a battle standard. He's practically a spearman without a shield, so he will die quickly. But anyway, uh, the Norse bodyguard is level 31. Norse noble is level 29. Uh, simply go for a Norse bodyguard. It ha The dude has the better armor. He's tankier and he's stronger. So for the Norse perspective... Uh, the Norse Bodyguard is the strongest unit. They also have um, one of the best archers in the game, Norse Warrior Archers, level 26. You won't find any better archers than this. Also, I need to uh, tell you that these guys are pagan, so the Norse faction is, Norse soldiers are pagan, so they will uh, butt heads with your Christian troops. Okay, so keep in mind. And then, for the Christian counterpart, we have the Saxons with the best infantry. The Saxon Noble, which is level 31, uh, practically mirroring mirroring the Norse. Uh, the only extra thing that they receive is they have some horses, level 26. They're not that good. Um, you can find better horse cavalry in, at other factions, and their Saxon, bow, their archer, their bowman is weaker than the Norse counterpart. But again, if you want the best infantry and um, make it Christian infantry, um, you go with the Saxon noble. He is the best on this end. Uh, next, you will you will be able you will be able to find Saxon units in southern Britain. So let me let me show you, let me show you real quick. So for Norse. Characters you will be you will be able to find them in Norway, duh, in Denmark, and you will also be able to find them in Frise. You will also be able to find them in Frise. Okay, um, you will also find Frisians here, but we'll talk about Frisians a little bit later. Uh, but you will also find Norse. So sometimes I go to a village, they either give me Frisian units or they give me Norse units. It's random. Uh, the Saxon troops are on southern Britain. You'll be able to find them here. 
So the Kingdom of Wessex, the Kingdom of East Engel, the Kingdom of Mears use these troops. And then let's go further north. Oh, and um, speaking of which, let me just make it daytime. There we go. So you people can see what's going on a little bit better. Okay. Then we have the Angles and the Briton. Well, uh, okay, so the Angle and the Britnon are pretty fucking similar. Pretty fucking similar. I can't say anything about it. Again, um, interestingly enough, uh, the Angles are Christian, and they have kind of the same troop type as the Norse. So in this case, the Angle bodyguard is the strongest unit, like in the Norse uh, perspective. But these are just Christian. Angle bowmen, again, weaker equal to the saxon counterpart not that useful for horsemen decent but i can show you a better horse in another faction and the angles again you'll be able to find them over here a little bit north of the west side of the saxon troops so around this area further up we can go to the briton now the briton uh faction is actually specialized into archers they do have better archers. Uh, these guys are almost as good at, as Norse uh, as Norse warrior archers. They just don't come equipped with a shield. Uh, so if you want a Christian archer, a, a good Christian archer, go for the Briton archer. Yo, RZ, welcome back to the end. My kingdom is currently right here. This is my kingdom. I still need to grab uh, Vlesinge, and I'm going to be able to eliminate the, f the Frisian faction on my own. Okay, and you can find the Britons around here, around the kingdom of Gwynedd. And then as we go north, we will reach uh, the kingdom of Northumbria. You will be able to find Norse troops again over here. You're trying to get it city with every years. Okay, dude, RZ. We'll talk a little bit later. I'm uh, doing the Viking Conquest guide right now. So Northumbria, think of them as the invaders from Norway. These will have Norse troops. Okay, further, we have the Irish. No, no, I'm not going to go with the Irish. I'm going to go with the Pictish peasants first, and we're going to talk about the Irish once we get there. Yo, Lord Napoleon, welcome back to the end, dude. I am a king of my own faction, good sir. Anyway, I'm creating the guide right now. So, we'll talk a little bit later. So, for the Picts, um, Picts are specialized into two units. Two, oh, actually, they're three units. Interesting, interesting. Did you notice? Uh, they're specialized into Pictish nobles. Uh, so, these are very good uh, skirmisher ca uh, cavalry. Uh, best cavalry in Britain... Uh, not not the best cavalry in Viking conquest. The best cavalry in Viking conquest we'll see in the Ireland in Ireland in Irish territories. Uh, but very good Pictish nobles. Uh, the Pictish champion, decent infantry troop. He comes with a short sword, which is pretty shitty. And then we also have the Pictish elite skirmisher, which comes with a crossbow. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, holy shit, crossbow, Rodok Vietnam flashbacks and shit. Um, they, they're definitely the best archers in the game. No, <laughs> I am sorry to disappoint, uh, but no, the Pictish Elite Skirmishers come with very, very weak chest armor. They're practically naked. They have eight body armor, a maximum of ten armor. They're paper. They're, they're the epitome of glass can. They do put a punch, so they do a lot of damage with the Pictish Crossbows. I'm not going to lie, the, these, these Pictish Crossbows are fucking amazing, but they die so fast so fast that you it's really really not worth it to go through them and they're so hard to level up that it's not worth to go with the P pictish elite skirmishers so so yeah yeah I, I know i got tricked i tried them um some of my viewers some of my friends tried them and they said the same thing the pictish elite skirmishers suck dick uh very good if you uh, put them amongst your archers, uh, and hopefully they don't die, but they're gonna die. 
they're gonna die and usually before they can put a dent into the enemy because viking conquest is a shield lover's wet dream it's a shield fest i swear every every unit and their mother's dog have a shield i swear i think people just shit shields in viking conquest so keep that in mind um so the picts you can find them all over northern britain at scotland territories so Squin and all of these territories are Pictish territories. You can find them there. You can have fun with them if you so desire. Uh, even from a garrison, Lord Napoleon, because siege in um, Viking Conquest is not like the siege in uh, the other games. Oh, and to answer your question, Lord Napoleon, this is my territory. I've conquered Frise. I conquered Frise. And even if they have the high ground, they're still going to die. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're just their armor is just too weak. They they can't take a hit from an from an arrow and they die. So it's kind of sad. Anyway, uh, let's go now to the Irish, the faction that we skipped upon. So the Irish have the Irish noble, decent infantry troop, the Irish bodyguard, um, one of the best cavalry units in the game. They're I think, in my opinion, they're better than the Pictish counterpart. But they're pretty the fucking same. Actually, I think the Pictish, uh, the Pictish Noble comes with a better armor, even. So, yeah, my bad. No, no, sorry. Uh, the Pictish have the best mounted units. Uh, the Irish Bodyguard is pretty okay with the armor too i think he has a lot more uh throwing weapons and then for our for their ranged options they're just spear throwers just skirmishers uh so nothing to boast home about you can find irish guys um i know i know you will not believe that but you can find the irish faction in ireland Holy shit, it's amazing. I know, you wouldn't have guessed it. Uh, but yeah, the entirety of Ireland, you will only be able to find Irish troops. Um, and that's it for the main factions. And that's it for the main factions. I know, Chris, I was surprised too. It's amazing. Uh, let's talk about the Frisians. This is the last faction. This is the tutorial faction. So, um, no, no, it's not a spoiler. If you start a campaign, you will start a campaign from Fries. And I feel like this is the tutorial faction. Um, but the Frisians are interestingly strong. Interestingly strong. Uh, let me explain why. So, uh, it's not because of the Frisian, vet the Frisian veteran. Um, all of the other factions have uh, infantry troops that can go up to level 29. And their, their Frisian horseman goes up to tw level 25. So, again, the other factions have... Um, mounted units that go up to level 29. Again, better troops. But what's strong about these guys? It's very simple. The Frisian Husmo, a level 15, the basic character, basic infantry, uh, basic unit, upgrades into the Frisian Horseman directly into a high tier troop, level 25. So the strength of the Frisians is that you can amass a large army of horsemen in a very short amount of time. That's the strength of the Frisians. And if you have enough horsemen, Viking Conquest is pretty similar to uh, Mountain Blade Vanilla, where if you have a big army of Swadianites, you murder everything. Kind of the same in Viking Conquest. If you have a large army of mounted units, you can pretty much break shit up. Break shit up. You're drunk and slav. Welcome to DN, dude. Um, I captured him, Lord Napoleon. I captured the dick waffle from Kenimer. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's the strength of the Frisians. You can amass a large horse army very, very fast. Uh, the problem with the other factions is that, holy shit, the Irish bodyguard is the last tier and it's going to take forever to level them up. Um, the Pictish, the same. It'll take forever to level them up into horsemen. Same problem. Frisians will get you the fastest mounted units. Yodok and Slav, uh, Christian playthrough in my playthrough. Okay. 
So, yeah, and look, the Saxon Horsemen, the Wessex Knights that you purchased, these guys are just level 26, so not that big of a difference from the Frisians. Okay, let's talk about refugees and peasant women. Uh, ladies, you can find them anywhere. Very hard to level them up to Camp Defender. I never managed to bring a peasant woman to a Camp Defender. They always die before they reach that status. Uh, the highest I could take them was Camp Follower, and as soon as they hit Camp Follower, they, I don't know, had a death wish, and they threw themselves upon the spear of the enemy. So, could not go beyond that. But again, decent archers on par with the Norse warrior archers. They just don't come equipped with a shield. That's all. That is all. Uh, if you manage to bring them up, congratulations. Alright, good for you, Lord Napoleon, my boy. Okay, farmer or townsman. Um, you can find farmers at farmsteads. Um, we'll talk about where to recruit troops from in a second um because it's different from the other mods and people people do not play viking conquest because they do not know how to recruit troops <laughs> not gonna lie not gonna lie okay so farmers hornman is shit don't go for hornman try to make them into decent infantry they're they're filler troops they're not that good uh but if you are hurting for troops you can fill the gap with some veterans Okay, uh, ruffians. Well, this is the bandit path. This is the bandit path. So if you go friendly with the ruffians, you know, if you're a raider all the way and you take the world, and if if you declare war on the world, you can go for a few of these units. The reaver and their highwaymen are go for the reaver because he has the shield. Nuff said. Nuff said. Go for the reaver because he has the shield. Uh, young warriors are slave drivers. Um, these are the guys that you can find inside taverns. Young warriors, actually, these are skirmishers. These are not infantry units. You will keep them as skirmishers in the back line. They will throw spears, and once they run out of spears, you can utilize them as infantry troops. Okay? And that's how this shit works on this end. And I think I went through all of them. I think I went through all of them. Uh, now I'm going to give you the top okay so now i'm gonna give you the top best units in oh right, right 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 i need to talk about uh some of the other units that you will be able to find through the game throughout the game uh let me see if i have yes you will find finn archers in the tavern decent troops they're level 23 so they're the second best archers in the game uh, i already talked about norse drunken slav you came in late Okay, so the Finn archers, um, second best archers in the game. If you find them in the tavern, buy them, hire them. Very, very good to uh, find in bulk and to amass a large number of them. Other troops that you can find inside the tavern are the old captain. Um, I think this is the best, yeah. This is the best mounted unit in the game, the old captain. You can sadly only find one of them at a time in a tavern, so if you find them, keep them safe until you amass a large number of them. Strong as fuck, strength 20, you will break shit up. You will break shit up. Uh, the Frankish knights, not the Frisian knights, the Frankish knights. The Frankish horsemen, actually, Lord Napoleon. Uh, you will always also be able to find the Frank Horsemen. They're on par um, right here. I have the Frank Horsemen right here. They're t level 29 and they're on par with the Irish and the Pictish horses. So practically very, very strong cavalry units as well. Yo, Des, welcome back to the end, dude. Again, you can find them in mass. You can buy them. Um, also, and one more unit, you can also find another unit inside the taverns, besides sailors, but we're going to talk about sailors in a bit. You will also be able to find Equitian Skirmishers. Now, Equitian Skirmishers are mounted spear throwers that do not come with a shield. Equitian Skirmishers are shit. <laughs> They're very expensive. So I think you have to pay 13k, uh, 13,000 penny gas 
for 11 of them and they're shit. They die in the first battle because they don't have any shields. So if a skirmisher farts in their general direction, they're going to fall like flies. So I'm sorry, but stay away from quitting skirmishers. They are very, very expensive. Okay, um, now let me go through top troops. Top troops, uh, these will be the best troops from, from the entire game. So, best infantry, Norse bodyguard, Saxon noble. I, why I'm saying best infantry? Because they have the same stats. Um, let, me, let me rephrase that. Best pagan Best Pagan Infantry, Norse Bodyguard. Best Christian Infantry, Saxon Noble and Angle Bodyguard. Okay. Um, best Infantry that you can find from a faction, a Sver Elite Vikings. You will find them around the world. You will find them in prisoner trains. Sadly, I don't think I have any Sver Elite Vikings to show you, but they're very fucking strong. Mm, no, I don't think. I don't think I have them. But again, very, very strong troops. You will not be able to see them in the troop tree. And that is it for best infantry. Best archers in the game. Um, pagan choice, Norse warrior archer. Hands down, highest stats, comes equipped with a shield, which is a fucking bonus. They're decent in melee, too. Uh, Christian counterpart, um, no, not the Saxons. I think it was the Britons. Yes. So the Briton archer, um, not as strong as the Norse, the Norse archer, but again, very strong Christian troop, very strong archer. It doesn't come equipped with the shield. And I do need to make special mentions to the peasant women. Camp Defender, on par with the Norse Warrior Archer, but does not come equipped with the shield. That's all. But very... And they're Christian. Very strong unit. Um, hello, Altar. Welcome to the end, good sir. I'm doing a guide right now. Uh, we will talk later, boys. And another special mention. Finnish Archers... Or, sorry. Finn Archers that you can find inside the taverns. Uh, they're... The second best to Norse archers, they come at level 23. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning them is because they're very, very good because you can find a lot of them inside taverns. You can find in one tavern 13, go to the next tavern, another 13. Bam, you have 26 Finn archers, and you didn't have to train anybody up. Because, it's, as we all know, in Viking Horus, it's pretty hard to level and train up characters. Okay, that is it for the archers. I'm not even going to mention the Pictish Elite Skirmisher, which comes equipped with a crossbow because they're just two glass cannon and not effective. I'm not sure for, from where they are, Drunken Slav. I assume they're from Finland. I assume they're from Finland. Um, so, the Elite Skirmisher, weak. Main reason, it has a very good weapon. I'm not going to deny. But the chest armor is lacking. They will die before they can put a dent into the enemy. Okay, and now best mounted units. Um, best mounted units, you will be able to find them. The Pictish Noble, level 29. In the Irish territories, the Irish Bodyguard. And then you will also be able to find the Frank Horseman. Again, another level 29. The very best there ever was cavalry unit is the Old Sea Captain. Uh, but the problem with these guys is... He comes at level 31, but the problem with the old captain is you will only be able to find one of them at a time in the tavern, so it's very hard to mass-produce them. A special mention goes to the Frisian horseman, uh, the Frisian horseman, the Ridere, over here, which comes at level 25, and the reason is because it's very easy to train them up in bulk because you only need the basic Frisian Hosmo, the Frisian basic unit, and level them up directly into horsemen, which is very easy. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm amassing a big pile of Frisian horsemen. And as long as you have a lot of them, they will do work. Okay, so those are the best units 
in the game. For skirmishers, it's everything's the same. Everything's the same skirmisher wise. I think one of the best ones, if you want spear throwers, are the Irish. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Standard bearers are useless. Irish, um, any and also any mounted unit that does not come with a shield is useless. So keep that in mind. Because there are axes and spears throwing all over the place. So you need a shield to survive in this game. Uh, that was it for troops. Now, let's talk about... We're going to talk a little bit about morale. So let's go to the character. Let's go to party section. Now, with morale, you won't have a problem. You won't have a problem if you fulfill certain aspects. Over here, you will be able to see uh, how many troops you can manage um, without, without having a morale penalty. So in this case, because, uh, because of the, all of the leadership and charisma combined, I can have, uh, I can manage 219 troops. But I can go up and beyond to 438, but I will have morale penalties. So in case you do that, you need to let them rest. You need to have food variety. Um, and do not mix religions if you want to go for the max amount of troops. Uh, it's simply not possible in Viking Conquest to run around with 438 troops at all time because they will lose morale and they will desert. Uh, so, but if you do, if you do go for max number of troops because you have to siege a castle and, you know, you just bring in the big guns and you want to take that fief, do not mix religions. Do not mix religions. So try to keep the pagan troops away from the Christian troops because they will nab at each other and you will receive a morale hit. Okay. Uh, that is pretty much it oh another thing that i need to mention about morale and party size for that matter is that leadership stacks leadership stacks it tell it over here because all of my companions have leadership the combined leadership gives me an extra 160 troops so for the love of god put leadership on all of your companions not just your main not just your main character okay pardon all right next up we're gonna talk about one of the most hated topics in viking conquest and that is recruiting troops okay so there are a lot of ways for you to recruit troops in the early game if you're christian you can go to farmsteads and monasteries to uh, recruit farmers. Yes, just farmers. Yeah. So practically basic units, basic infantry slash skirmisher units. Not very good. And if you're pagan, you can't even you can't even recruit from monasteries, you just need to hit the farmsteads. So very, very weak. Um, another way to recruit troops is to recruit them from taverns you will be able to, you will be able to find them in taverns um you know aquitian skirmishers which you should stay away from uh finn archers uh veterans young warriors sver warriors um frankish horsemen and sailors and sailors um they're expensive stay away from them in the early game you will not have the money to hire them uh another Another way to hire troops is, this one is less known. This one is less known. You just stroll to town. Please let me on my horse, though. Ah, okay. It didn't let me on our horse, but it, it, it took us to the right section. In the town, in the docks, you will be able to find old sea captains. The sea captains will give you sailors. Let me just uh, look for them for him quickly. I think he's over there on the left somewhere. Should find him in a second, and I'll show you. No. Might be at the end of the docks, but trust me, they're here. 
and he will give you sailors for cheap, dirt cheap. Armorer, weaponsmith. Yeah, here we go. The shipwright will build you ships. The old sea captain. Um, two who I suspect would jump at the chance. You just need to pay 40 penny gas for them. And you can receive from just one up to 13 or 14 sailors. So that's pretty fucking sexy. Now, sailors are tier 2 skirmishers. They're not infantry. Keep them in the back. They have slings. Keep them away from the front line. Okay? So, this is another way to amass troops quickly, finding an old sea captain. Another very, very workable and good way to find troops is just finding them in prisoner trains. Um, fighting um, the bandits of the land, thieves, ruffians, um, elite vikings, uh, vikingr, you can also find them. I think... Um, there are renegades in Norway. Some of them can come with a prisoner train of over a hundred prisoners. And they're yours for the taking. You can just hire them. Yes, you can also, as uh, Altar said, you can also find uh, sailors on the sea in, pri in enemy prisoner trains. So, all is good over there. Uh, sea Raider, please stop. Okay, um, what else? What else? Um, yes, now we need to talk about the villages. Now, one of the buzzkills for um, Viking Conquest is that usually, usually in any other mod, you just go to a village, ask if anybody wants to join, a, uh, join this, uh, or join us, and you receive units from that faction. Well, in Viking Conquest, you have to bribe the village leader to give you troops and depending on the renown that you have uh, you either need to pay 300 penny gas if you have high renown or 500 penny gas so literally 500 of these um, and then you can permanently recruit from those villages from those territories um, what else okay um sea raider rc do you want to time out until i finish the guide Please. Uh, so, another way to recruit from the villages is you need to talk with uh, lord with lords and ask them permission to recruit from their settlements from their um, villages. So, but that requires you to have at least five relations with them and have at least 150 renown. So it's pretty shitty. It's expensive. You need to do quests with them. What I recommend that you do is as soon as you hit the trade routes, as soon as you hit the monies, like you see here, just go to all of the villages in the world and pay to recruit from them 300 or 500 penny gas. It's not a lot of money once I show you how to make money in Viking Conquest. Okay? Okay. Um, oh, also, you can recruit from castles and towns, too. So, for example, I can go to Dorstad and I can ask for potential recruits. And I receive 17 Norse companions based on the relation with the towns. So, relation is very important with the towns, too. And yes, sometimes if you ha like Altair said, if you have high relation with the village, uh, they can just uh, you can just they can give you permission to recruit uh, troops from there for free. That's also an option. And yes, as you increase relations with uh, towns, castles, and villages, you will have a chance to get high tier troops. For example, we got uh, seventeen Norse freeholders, which are tier two troops. Uh, if I show you in the troop tree section, look, we received directly a tier 2 troop. Sometimes you have the chance of receiving a tier 3 troop if you have high enough relations. And that kind of breaks, uh, breaks uh, the need to train them up yourself. Okay, let's see. 
What else do I need to talk about recruiting? That's pretty much it. So bottom line, what I recommend that you do in the early game is not even go for a high arm, uh, a huge army. If you're in campaign mode, once you leave, okay, I consider Frige the starting area, the tutorial zone of the campaign mode. Once you leave Free Dorstadt, if you have 25 troops, you're okay. Don't go beyond that. If you start off in sandbox mode and you start off with the merchant build, don't go beyond 25 troops. Again, keep it keep it small, keep it small, keep an elite force until you get the ball rolling and until you make a lot of money. Uh, training troops is going to be a, a different topic, RZ. It's going to be a little bit of a different topic. Um... So that's what you need to do in the early game with troops. And once you get to the late game, you'll have a lot of money and you'll simply pay for all of the villages to recruit troops. So it's not that big of a deal. Plus, you'll find archers in the tavern, so you never need to go to upgrade archers. So all oh, is good. Uh, sure, Napoleon, I will show it to you once we get to the early game. Okay? So stand in there. Keep it in there, my man, because I'm going to show you. Now, let's talk a little bit about training up troops. Uh, so, the easiest way to train up troops is the classic way. Just have on as many companions as possible trainer. Uh, trainer goes up only up to five. But even then, it's hard to train up troops. I mostly have a mid-tier. Mid-tier up to low-tier troops. But they're still very, very effective, even if they're low-tier. One of the reasons why low-tier units are are just as effective as some of the high tier units is because and i recommend this you need to have gear effects skills on if you don't have this on the high tier troops will simply be op and broken and they will clean the floor with you because i have gear effect skills on my character has a penalty to athletics of five penalty to power throw of I think so around four or something and power strike is up it should be 10 but i receive a penalty of one to power strike because i have very heavy armor okay um and another way to train up troops is through your garrison so inside your garrison you will be able to talk in the lord's hall in this case with your minister in your fiefs i made solveig my minister because i didn't marry i recommend that you do and you can talk with her about training up troops yeah training of men she's already training the troops in my garrison so that will do that will happen automatically and you can also do that at your own refugee i have my refugee built over here i named it booty home fortress because i am a childish prick again if you hire the trainer over there and put the troops inside the trainer will um, give um, will give will train the troops up for you in mass in mass uh, yes Altair that is the trolls axe that I have in the inventory but we'll talk about weapons in a second uh, so that's pretty much it for training um, usually it's just a good idea to find high tier troops inside taverns and um, inside prisoner trains and just skip the training part altogether but that's the hard truth it's not easy to level up troops okay uh, next subject that we're going to be talking about is going to be best boats okay best boats and i have three boats for you and i think i have two of them with me okay one thing that I like about this DLC is that you can get a trophy after defeating a lord, and you can sell it in your town for money, and also get some relations with them. That is true, Lord Napoleon, and we'll talk about that in the mid-game. Okay, so for boats, the three best boats as you can find are the Snekia. Uh, the Snekia, this is how it's written, uh, it's a fast ship that can have 27 men. Tops, 27 men tops, you can't go beyond that. And it's very, it's a very, very good early game ship when you're trading around the world and making a lot of money. Very good early game. And also, minor spoiler, this is the type of ship that you will receive in the campaign at one point. 
So if you're playing the campaign, don't buy yourself a ship because you will receive one. Then we have the skate. Sadly, I don't have the skate. Uh, I don't have a skate. I didn't find one in the port. But skates are the fastest ships in the game. Simply the fastest, and you can have up to fifty-five troops on them. Fifty-five troops on them. Um, you'll be able to find the skates usually in Dorstad, Ribe, and Tunsberg. That's where they appear. And then the last ship, which is the best late game ship in the game, the Boos. It's uh, typed, I think you already seen it. It's this one, the Boos, B-U-S-S-E-E. -E. Um, it has a capacity of 90 troops, 90 troops on one ship. It's the biggest ship, and also it's a little bit slower than the Skade, Again, pretty fucking good. Late game, you'll want to have boosts, buses all over the place, okay? And again, boosts has a high chance of appearing in Dorstad, Ribe, and Tunsberg. Okay, uh, next up, that's that's pretty much it for the boats. That's pretty much it for boats. Um, you can also modify their looks, their sails, their paintwork, but that's just cosmetics. They, it, they, it does not modify the stat for the ships and yes altair they are very very expensive they're very expensive oh one common mistake that people do regarding ships is that they go inside a port and they see the boltval or the fiardacola or the tranan or the barden that's not the tr the ship type that's the name of the ship under that name you'll see the ship type okay so don't you worry if you don't find just keep an eye out for Boos, Sinekia, and the Skade. Uh, Skade is uh, spelled S as in Sam, K as in Kilogram, E as in Edward, I as in India, D as in David. Okay, that's the Skade. So if you see them. The reason I'm spelling it out is because I don't have a ship like that to show you. Just didn't find one. Okay, uh, that's it for best boats. Now we will talk about damage types and best weapons and special locations okay so this is going to be a tough one this is going to be a long one um damage types are not important in viking conquest they're not that important uh blunt weapon there's not a good blunt weapon that you can find in the game that's decent i think you can find some clubs that have 10 blunt damage but they're horrible um but to fix this the game developers made it possible that there's a high chance that there's a higher sorry not a high chance a higher chance for the enemy to not die outright if you have a cutting weapon for example right now i have the tempered bandit king sword and it does 38 cutting damage that cutting damage and that piercing damage has an equal chance of killing the tr the, the enemy or knocking him unconscious and thus you being able to grab a prisoner so you don't need to focus on blunt weapons also cutting is cutting and piercing is pretty much king if you go for a spear uh piercing will be very good against armored units but even cutting damage does very good against armored units just because it will have a high power strike skill yo kikade welcome to dn dude i'm creating the guide for viking conquest right now okay so give me a sec just because you have such a high amount of power strike, which I recommend that you do, you will not have problem with damage types. Cutting, piercing, and blunt is the least important in Viking Conquest. Least important. Okay, uh, next up, let's talk about best weapons and armor. Okay, so best weapons and armor. This is going to be a long one because we, I will tell you about all of the special locations in the game okay and where to find them so first of all let's talk actually let's talk about the non-unique weapons first non-unique armor and weapons that you can find uh one of the best non-unique weapons that you can find is in irish territories well the Britain sword or the rich sword they have the same stats you can find them in Britain very good swords 
Um, but in Irish territories, you will be able to find... I think it's this one. I think uh, Kayo has it. Yes, the Godalic Champion Sword. This is the only weapon that's that can be a two-hander and a one-hander at the same time. It's by far one of the strongest non-unique weapons in the game. And you cannot use it on horseback. So... If you want to go for a foot soldier build, the Godela Champion Sword will be beautiful and destructive in your hands. Okay? Beautiful and destructive. Okay, um, for spear, just a common spear. Usually, most spears are, have the same stats, so you can just take your pick from there if you want to go for a spear build. Okay, so uh, those are the non-uniques. Now... Let's talk about the unique locations and what do they give you. Uh, we're gonna go with Denmark first. In Denmark, you'll be able to you will be able to go to not Torshof. You'll be able to go to the Trolls Bridge. Uh, the Trolls Bridge. Spoiler alert: um, You will find the troll. If you don't pay the toll, you'll have to fight him. He is very strong. Bring javelins and bring um and try to hit his head because he doesn't have a helmet on if you defeat him you will i know i know yes the troll is human but he's a big boy he's a giant um if you defeat him you will receive the troll's axe which is the weapon with the highest strength requirement in the game you require uh, strength 21 um if you go with the noble warrior build that i showed you you can have uh, strength 21 from level 1 or from level 13, your choice. If you go with the merchant, merchant build and you pardon, really want the Troll's Axe, you, can, you will be able to equip it at level 26. Okay. Uh, troll Axe, as you saw, pretty big. It cannot be used on a horseback. I'm using it because if my horse dies in battle, and it, you, that usually happens, I just bring out the troll axe and start swinging away. But even then, even then, I still prefer to utilize a sword and board because skirmishers. Okay, um, um, I will talk about the horn right now. The horn will simply increase the morale of your men. They will not uh, retreat. This can drop randomly from fights against uh, other vassals and lords. Randomly, you equip it. You go into a horn animation and you bolster the morale of your troops. They don't break so easily. You just keep blocking with the sword and keep kicking for hours like a noob to get the troll down. That's also an option. That's also an option. I'll die. Oh, also, uh, make sure you have some decent weapon maintenance. You don't want your weapon to break during the troll fight. Okay, um, also, don't worry. If you get defeated by the troll, you simply lose some reputation. And you can just go fight again, or you can, you know, save scum it, uh, save before you enter the event, and fight. So that is the troll bridge. Um, I'm going to talk about Ulf's farmstead at the end. Let's go to Tunsberg, to Norway. In Norway, the unique location is Odin's Cave. Um, don't you worry about Odin's Hoth. These are practically the pagan monasteries that you can go ahead and raid if you want to. Okay, so in this case, Odin's Cave. Uh, you need to fight some bandits inside. If you kill the Bandit King, you will receive the Sword of the Bandit King. So this is the current sword that I'm using. It's already tempered. Yes, you can re reforge and reinforce the weapons that you find. Uh, tempered Bandit King, 38 cutting damage, 20, 20 piercing damage, speed reach, and weapon reach. Very good. Very good weapon if you go for a mounted build. Decent if you're an infantry too. Pretty sexy weapon. Uh, you also receive a piece of armor from Odin's Cave. So, I think a scale, a scale Lorica or something like that. Let me check. It's, it's okay. Just a high-tier armor that you either you or one of your companions can use. It's not unique. You can find them in battles, too. Okay, next up. Let's go... So we finished Denmark. We finished Greece. We finished Norway. Let's go to Southern Britain. Now, in Southern Britain, you have Boar's Grove, where you simply need to find to fight the old hero. 
if you defeat the old hero, he's not as tough as the troll. Um, he's not as tough as Grendel from the Troll Bridge. If you defeat the old hero, you will receive a scale Lorica and just a decent sword. Uh, the scale Lorica is the sexy bit in this case. I think Donchan has the scale Lorica. Let me check. Oh, sorry. Equipment. Yeah, you will receive this armor. The scale Lorica 4626. So, pretty fucking good armor. If it's not good on yourself and you have something better, give it to one of your companions. They become beasts. Alright, then from Boar's Grove, we go to the southwest to the Roman Fort. Now, um, I heard different, different stories about the Roman Fort. To do the Roman Fort, um, here you will, be, you will need to answer a few uh, riddles. You will answer a few riddles. I'm not going to give the riddle answers because they're a fun thing to try on your own. So before you enter the Roman Fort, just save beforehand and give it a shot. It's pretty cool. If you um, answer all of them, you will receive the best helmet in the game, the elf helmet, which I'm wearing. 53 to head armor. I haven't reinforced this yet, but you can also reinforce the armor. And it's, it's heavy. It's heavy altar. Most of these, uh, I think all of the rewards that you receive are heavy armor. Uh, the Elf's Helm, 53. You can also receive the Elf's Shield. And you will also receive the Elf's Sax. Uh, the Elf's Sax is not that good. You can block with it. It's just a decent sword if you have a shield. Uh, I sadly don't have the Elf's uh, Sax and the Elf's Shield because I didn't answer the riddles correctly. So, yeah, that shit happens. Now, um, the thing that I wanted to mention about the Roman Fort, um, to answer these riddles, you will need to have 20k penning gas, because if you don't, have the, if you don't answer a riddle correctly, the, the elf, the dude, will take from you 5,000 5, penning gas. Uh, some people told me that you just need 5,000. 5, uh, some people told me you need 20,000. I recommend that you just go with 20,000 and answer the riddles correctly, and you'll receive Elf Helm, shield, uh, the Elf Shield, and the Elf Sex. Further west, we have nothing. Okay, let's go to the north, to the Strange Ruins over here. Okay, so over at the Strange Ruins, you will have to fight a lot of bandits. You will have your companions with you, you will have to fight a lot of bandits, and you will receive one of the best swords in the game, uh, on par with uh, with what I'm using, on par with what I'm using, the Tempered Bandit King Sword, uh, the sword called Nad. It's pronounced, uh, it's spelled N-A-D, Nancy Apple David. The Nad is a very strong sword, very useful for mounted combat, if you want to go for it. Um, I lost my Nad in a battle, so remember, yo, no player, thank you for subscribing on YouTube, good sir, really appreciate it. Uh, so I lost my I lost my nad in battle. You can lose your equipment. Be careful about that. Uh, but I don't save scum, so I lost it. I just replaced it with another sword. So again, from the strange ruins, you will receive the nad, and you will also receive uh, some armor, some decent armor if you drop. But nothing to write home about. Okay, now we go further north. Hmm, ancient stones. Actually, I don't remember about the ancient stones. I'll have to figure that one out. I never been to the ancient stones. Oh, when I when I do, I will write that. Yo, Altair, thank you for becoming a follower, dude. Welcome to Hitpoint Inn. My name's Roval. I'll be your bartender, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Drinks are on me. Um, I'll just write a comment in the video section about the ancient stone because I haven't been there yet. So my badsies, my badsies. Further north, we have Adrian's Wall. Now, at Adrian's Wall, you will not receive a weapon. You will not receive armor. You will receive a companion. So, if you do the quest at Adrian's Wall, I'm not going to tell it. It's a easy quest. You can figure it out on your own. If you do the quest, you will be able to grab Kayo as your companion. He will listen to you. He's a good guy. He's a very good pathfinder. Okay. So this can be your Pathfinder, Tracker, Spotter in your party, if you want him. Uh, so once you do the quest, you revisit Adrian's Wall and 
you will receive Kayo in your party. Just make sure that you have enough room in your army for him. Okay, further north, we have the farmland. One of the most hidden away zones in the game. So, I assume you've noticed around that there are farmsteads. From farmsteads, you can work there. You can uh, recruit farmers from there. You can buy food from there. But the farmland is not a farmstead. It's a special event location. And over at the farmland, let me check. Yes, over at the farmland, uh, you will be ambushed by Vikings. So you need to survive an ambush. And if you manage to win, you will receive the Pictish Lorica. And I think I have someone equipped with the Pictish Lorica. Um, is it Agathanos? Let me check. Yes, Agathanos has the Pictish Lorica. You will receive this piece of armor if you survive the farmland event. Uh, 40, 22, again, pretty fucking amazing. And you can further reinforce it at one of the armor smiths in town. Alrighty then, further, further north from uh, the farmlands, you will be able to find... I think this is the last location on the... Uh, on Britain, the Stone Row. Over at the Stone Row, you will find a band of bandits, and you can sell slaves to them if you don't beat them up. Okay, so at Stone's Row, you go, you talk with the dude, and you can sell your prisoners to him for a little bit of extra cash. Not by a lot, you would receive an extra 10 penny gas for each prisoner, so it's, n again, nothing to write home about. Just look for ransom brokers in a tavern and you'll receive the same amount of money. Um, if you beat them, you simply receive a scale scale mail armor, so similar to the Pictish Lorica, but a little bit on the lower end. Not a unique armor piece, uh, but hey, it's your choice if you want to sell prisoners or if you want to destroy the Stone Road location. I destroyed it because... I, I was kind of meh about it. Now, the last zone in the Irish territories, you will be able to find the Mystic Circle. Over at the Mystic Circle, you will find one of the best swords in the game, the sword called Dragwandil. And a scale. You'll also receive a scale mail armor. Again, the same as in Stone Row. Uh, Dragon Deal. I think. I think Brunhild has a Dragon Deal. Oh no. no, no, no. I think somebody from my party has a Dragon Deal equipped. No, I'm gonna just go through them quickly just to make sure. I know this is a chipped lance axe. Alchu, I think he has... Uh, oh, this is the Dragon Deal. Okay, so the Dragon Deal is a 28, cutting damage, 22, piercing damage. It, hello, Alan, welcome to the end, good sir. I'm making a guide right now. Uh, Dragon Deal is on par with Nad and um, the other sword, uh, the Bandit King sword that I'm utilizing. Uh, remember, this Dragon Deal is not reforged. It's not retempered, so you can do that. Yes, yes, it's... It's a little bit on the weaker side, but again, it's a unique weapon. Um, I think it's on par with the Berserker swords, the Ulfbert swords that you can find. Okay, now, um, that's all of the locations. All of the locations. Um, regarding the Ancient Stones, I will have to check that place out um, off-screen, and I'm going to tell you guys in uh, the comment section about what you can find over there. Uh, we'll talk about that again in a second, Hello Music, about traits. I also wanted to mention the armor that you can acquire, the best armor in the game, that you can acquire only in the campaign mode. So, uh, minor spoilers ahead. In Once you reach the Denmark portion of the campaign, at Ulf's Farmstead, you will need to defeat a Berserker at one point. You will go into a duel, and you'll need to defeat a Berserker. And if you defeat him, you will get a decent, actually a decent, best armor in the game, called the Orm, Orm's Lorica. That's, Orm is the Berserker that you need to fight. You receive this piece of armor, and 
as you can see, I reinforced it. 62, 32, 16. Yes, you can give this armor to the NPC. Just keep it for yourself and you're going to be good to go. Best armor in the game and makes it look like a fucking badass. Reinforce, it gives you 16, 62, and 32 to leg armor. Hands down, you are a tank with this shit. But you can only get it in the campaign mode. Um... Other very good armors that you can't acquire by honest means. You can activate the cheat menu and you can find the Troll's Tunic and Thor's Armor. And you can also find Thor's Hammer. Uh, the Hammer does 65 damage uh, per swing, but it has a very short reach. You can find these in the cheat menu from the camp if you turn the cheats on. Okay, I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to break my playthrough. But I think it's let me say camp menu options go all the way fucking down or something. Or oh more more toggle cheat menu on and from there you will be able to do whatever you want, my good sir, and cheat away if so you wish. Uh, so yeah, that's it for um, the locations. Next up, what I want to talk about is the early game. Okay, so in the early game, what do you want to do? You have a lot of work to do. I'm going to talk about both uh, the campaign and sandbox mode because you need to do both of these. Uh, you need to do these things in both sandbox and campaign mode as soon as possible just so you have a very, very good playthrough. Um, so, first of all, Campaign. In the campaign, always save. Hear me out. Always save before you do an event for the campaign because there's permadeath. If you die in the campaign events, you die in the game and it's permadeath. You need to start the campaign all over. So save scum that shit. I save scummed. I'm not proud of it, but I do not want to repeat the entire campaign because I lost on a mid game campaign battle. Okay. Uh, nope. Always, Alan. Always. Events that are related to the campaign, you perma die. Really. Um, the locations like uh, Trolls Bridge or Odin's Cave or stuff like that, you you don't die because they're not part of the campaign, and you can still access them in sandbox mode. So keep in mind. Uh, yes, hello music. Uh, you can get Berserker armor from normal Berserkers. It can fall. You can also get strong armor from Elite Svir Vikings or Elite Viking that you can find around the world if you beat them up. There's a chance that uh, their armor with the bear pelts and the, and the wolf pelts will drop. Okay, so um, what do I want to talk about in the early game? First, in the early game, let's talk about the traits, the special traits that uh, Hello Music has mentioned. So, uh, <laughs> there are four traits that you can go for, and I'll need the character screen for this. Um... The four traits, these are special traits, special abilities that you can acquire, are the following. Inspiring, tough, strong, and berserker. These are the four traits that you can acquire. And you will acquire them after you hit level 13. And at least 20 days have passed in the world. You can't acquire the trait before that. You can acquire it in campaign mode, you can acquire it in sandbox mode, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, Inspiring gives you the ability to use a war cry, which increases the damage of your troops by 5%. All of your army does 5% extra damage. To activate this trait, you press the T button. To acquire this trait, to acquire it, before you, before you hit level 13, you me need to make sure that your leadership is higher then your power strike, athletics, and iron flesh. It's higher, okay? All right, the second trait is tough. With the tough ability, you can utilize a shield talent, which increases the movement speed of your troops 
by 10%. The entirety of your army, you increase their movement speed by 10% by pressing again the T button. The T button, uh, T as in train. Okay. To acquire the tough skill, the, the tough trait, you need to have athletics higher than your leadership, iron flesh, and power strike. Okay. Um, the also and make sure you don't have your heavy armor equipped once you hit level thirteen. So because uh, the game will take into consideration the heavy armor that you're wearing. So for example, if I want to grab the tough skill, the tough trait right now, I need to take this off so my athletics is, is boosted back up at six. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, the next, the next, the next trait that you can go for is called strong. Uh, again, it's a shield taunt. With the shield taunt, this will give you a 5% damage reduction to all of your troops. Again, you activate it by pressing the T key. 5% damage reduction to all of your troops. Uh, this scales very, very well with armor. So if you have high-end troops, that 5 damage reduction is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, to have the strong shield taunt, you need to make sure that your iron flesh is higher so at level 13 your iron flesh is higher than power strike athletics and leadership afterwards you could just go ham but at level 13 you need to make sure that your iron flesh is higher to get the strong trait the last trait is the berserker trait uh this gives you a buff to your own character for a temporary amount of time on the field of battle Okay, listen, listen. The Berserker trade will give you 25% extra damage increase and 10 movement speed, 10% extra movement speed on the field of battle uh, for a short duration of time. You can activate the Berserker skill by pressing the T button, but it's only for a short duration of time. Once you get exhausted, you'll receive a penalty to your stat of minus 30 damage, 30% uh, damage. So minus 30% damage done, and then minus 40% movement speed. Um, and this is only for your character, not army wide. Okay, so um, I'm gonna tell you from the strongest to the weakest on these traits, the strongest trait that you can go for is the strong trait, the shield taunt, that gives a uh, 5% five, 5 damage reduction to your troops. Just because it scales so well with your armor, uh, it's going to be more beneficial to keep your troops alive more than, for, ex for example, give them the extra damage boost. If they live more, they do more damage. If a soldier is dead, it can't do damage. That's the logic behind it. That's why strong is the best trade that you can get. And to get it, you need to have Iron Flesh higher than Power Strike, Athletics, and Leadership. Okay, the second best is Inspiring. Uh, the war cry that gives a 5% damage boost. To get it, you need to have leadership higher than the rest of the stats that I mentioned. Um, the 5% extra damage boost is, well, of course, amazing, but still tough. The defensive stat is better than this. They do more damage, but they die quicker. Thus, they won't be able to do more damage if they die. Uh, third best, uh, by a long shot. So the third best is pretty down there is the movement speed movement speed the tough the shield town that increases the movement speed uh to get it you need to have athletics high higher than the rest of the stats uh the reason why it's weak is because if you charge in your troops it's you're dead it's suicide you will mostly have your troops in formation waiting for the enemy trying to slowly move forward and kill the enemy that way so the 10 movement speed is a waste simply a waste and most pretty much it for that one and then the last place the berserker trait i feel like it's the weakest just because it be, besides giving you a damage boost it also gives you a debuff after you use it and it only lasts for around a minute so 
it's bad. It's just bad. Um, it's much better to go the Paladin route, I guess, and gain an aura that affects the entirety of your army. So that's why I'm putting the Berserker on the last place. But hey, if you want to fulfill your fantasy and Berserkers give you a hard-on to acquire it, make sure at level 13 you have Power Strike, uh, higher than Iron Flesh, Athletics, and Leadership. It's you, that's my opinion, um, and that's my reasoning behind my decisions. Okay, so that's it for traits. Um, oh, right, I forgot to, t to mention something in the best weapons section. I forgot to mention about the weaponsmiths. So at a weaponsmith in town, you can acquire uh, high-end gear without needing to at these locations but you need to pay for them you need to pay for them and to acquire this high-end gear you need to have at least 600 renown true that is also true altair but still not that useful for berserkers um the weapons that you can acquire is the widowmaker a very strong sword uh, sorry sword a uh, sword and um, another very good weapon, if you want a spear, a very good spear, the best spear in the game is the ray, that again, you can buy from the weaponsmith. Um, you can also tell the weaponsmith to surprise you, but you can receive from junk weapons to very strong weapons. One of the stronger weapons, another very good sword, is the siren song that you can acquire from the weaponsmith. Uh, you can also acquire decent armor, scale mail, and scale lorica's from the armor smith. Again, by asking for surprises. So, if you don't want to go to these uh, locations to find the legendary equipment, you can just go ahead and buy yourself some decent weapons and armor from the weaponsmith and armor smith, respectively. Okay. Uh, Close parenthesis. Uh, now, let me check. What else do I need to talk about? I need to talk about the early game. Okay, what do you do in the early game? Okay, so... I'm gonna... First, I'm gonna explain real quick in the campaign, with no spoilers, when you need to do these things. So, in the campaign, you start in Freeze. And Freeze is kind of a tutorial zone. Once you get out of Freeze and you reach Denmark, that's going to be the next location for the storyline, this is the moment where you can free roam the world and do the things that I'm going to mention over here that you need to do in the early game. So, um, sandbox mode, you're going to start in Southern Britain or wherever your ethnicity is. If you're Norse, you're going to start in Norway and so on and so forth. Uh, you need to start doing these things right off the bat because you can free roam the lands as you see fit. It's sandbox mode. Nope, if you give us a fuck, what do you do in sandbox mode, right? Okay, so, um, first thing you need to do is gather as many companions as possible. Find and gather all of the companions, all of them, and then send them to gather a right to rule. Just so you can build your way to create your own kingdom later on. Um... In the meantime, while you're searching for your companions, start trading. If you're a raider, gather some troops and start pillaging and fighting. Um, you need to gather up money and build enterprises in as many cities as possible around the world. The, the end game objective is that you have an enterprise in all of the cities. Uh, let me show you guys my... Um, budget i have uh enterprise in all of the cities except except uh, one or two cities uh, with the kingdom of gwynedd because i wasn't able to do peace I, I made a mistake i wasn't able to do uh uh to make peace with that faction so i couldn't build a enterprise over there but i have um enterprises everywhere everywhere else that provide me with a shit ton of money Okay, now you're going to ask me, what's the best enterprise that you can build? There is no best enterprise that you can build. You need to talk with the guildmaster, oh, sorry, not guildmaster. You need to talk with the mayor of the town and ask him about each enterprise, how much money will it give you per week. In some of them, I found Ironworks was great. In some of them, the brewery was fucking great. Um, in some of them, wool 
uh, wool uh, weavery was decent. Um, mo in the majority of them, I think the winners are ironworks and uh, brewery, but in some of them you will be wool. So the short answer, ask the mayor how much you will get for each enterprise. Also, enterprises are a little bit more expensive than in the other games. Uh, everything is a little bit more expensive in Viking Conquest, uh, but that's compensated with the fact that you'll be making a shit ton of money. Um, so, um, what was I saying about the enterprises? Oh, yes, yes. Um, the, the most expensive enterprise that you will need to acquire is 17.5k, so 17,500 penny gas. Uh, make sure that you have that that amount of money before you go into a town and decide um, what enterprise you need to go. All right, Alan, have a good day, dude. Thanks for stopping by. Now, um, you're going to ask me, but wait, to build these enterprises, I need money. What do I do to acquire money? Okay, so if you are, there are two ways, two very simple ways to make money in this game. Uh, the first way is you fight. You fight, you kill, you take prisoners, you sell them, and you make a shit ton of money off of selling gear from the enemy. Selling gear from the enemy. Uh, so, if you go on the raider route, just fight, kill, maim, destroy, pillage monasteries um, of the enemy religion. You know, enemy religion. If you're, if you're Christian, you raid pagan. If you're pagan, you raid Christian monasteries. And that's way you will make a shit ton of money. And the second way to make money is, like Hello Music is saying, through trading. Okay, so trading. I will give you guys the best trade route in the game and the shortest trade route in the game to make a shit ton of money. But first, I'm going to close the window because somebody decided to work right outside of my window. Fun time. Okay, so trade route. Um, I'm going to tell you the short version for those who do not want to get into details. And then I'm going to tell you the long version of trading. So short version, you can just write this down if you want to. Short version, buy wool from Britain. So on the Britain, uh, on the main isle buy wool from Britain from the villages it's very cheap uh, don't buy actually you'll usually find it at a max amount of 400 um, low amount I even found at 80 wool at wool baskets they look like this do I have wool baskets no I don't have wool. oh yes I do these are the wool baskets buy them from southern Britain you'll also be able to find them in Ireland but it's kind of a long way to go for wool so if you'll find enough in southern Britain um, no hello music. Sometimes you will find iron, but I'm, I'm telling the short version now. So, buy wool from Britain, sell it at Dorstad. Buy wine and jewelry and salt from Dorstad. Sell it at Ribe and Tunsberg. Don't buy anything from Ribe. From Tunsberg, buy tar and mead. Go west to sell Rigmanade. Sell mead there and sell tar in all of the towns in Britain. And then simply buy wool again. And then go back to Dorstad, sell the wool, buy jewelry, buy wine, and so on and so forth. And this is the circle. This is the trade circle that you will be going for. You will make a shit ton of money. Now, let's get into the knit and gritty. Um, so, knit and gritty. In Britain, you will be able to find um, mead and wool, sometimes iron, at cheap price that you will want to sell in Dorstad. Um, don't buy mead that's over 200. Always sell mead that's around 400. Wool, uh, you will be able to find them, uh, the prices for wool, you'll be able to find them between uh, 80 or below up to 400. 
even if you see wool at 400 buy it because in doorstat you'll sell that shirt for 700 so you're gonna make a shit ton of money okay iron you'll sometimes find it at 38 i found iron in uh Den in norway at 38 penny gas which is dirt cheap uh but you can find it at around 200 i think up to 400 you can sell it in doorstad you can sell iron uh, in doorstad for 500 don't sell below okay um i think that's it once you get to doorstad and you sell all of this buy jewelry jewelry you'll find at around 500 penny gas and you'll be able to sell the jewelry everywhere else for uh double the amount for around 1000 penny gas buy wine wine is very cheap you'll find it at in between 100 and 200 penny gas just buy all the wine because you will sell that shit for 700 in other towns 700 and also buy the salt you'll find cheap salt in doorstad for around 150 penny gas you can sell the salt for up to between 300 and 250 in other towns of the world in ribe is just a selling location you, there's nothing worth buying from ribe to, to be worth your time um in tonsberg you will find tar that sells for around uh, that you can buy it for around 200 it sells for 400 so sell it um for 420 between 425 and 380 and you're gonna be making a decent profit off of tar tar buckets that's how they look like um you can also if you if you really want to just you know try to maximize your profit as much as possible you can also verify the towns the small villages for um iron and soapstone you can sell the soapstone for around 300 um or 250 in the other towns but it's not that worth it uh Tonsberg also has some cheap mead again for mead don't buy uh mead over 200 you can sell it for up to 400 350 in the other territories now why am i not mentioning ireland in ireland you can find okay sorry my bad in ireland you can you, you have towns where you can find cheap mead um, and you can also find wool over there. The only problem is it takes a long ass time to reach Ireland, to reach Ireland and then go back. Okay, some uh, minor, some minor trade routes. If you're stuck in Ireland, for example, um, you can buy mead from Russell Tear, Mystew, Dublin, Kaseal, and sell it at Tamer. Tamer. Oh, sorry. I might, I might be making a mistake here. Either Tamer or Mystew are some very thirsty motherfuckers, and they will buy mead for four hundred. Okay, so buy mead from the rest of the towns and sell them at either Mystew or Tamer. You will see the price once you get inside the shop. Another, another small trade route is buying mead from Edinburgh and selling it at Selrigmanade. Again, you'll make a quick profit. Um, in the southern territories of Britain, visit the villages to find the most of the wool. It, it's very, very cheap. And you can also buy cheese from villages and send them uh, and sell them into towns. You'll make a quick a, around 80 penny ass profit. Um, you can buy cheese for 22 and sell it in town for 100. So you're, you're going to be able to make some quick cash that way. Also, all around the world... If you buy cheap from villages, you can sell them a little bit high in uh, in the towns. For example, I sometimes find wool in Fries, for example, in Fries. I sometimes find wool inside the villages for 300 and I sell it to Dorstad for 700 Bam, quick money right there. And that is a trade route in detail. That's a trade route. I do recommend that you go with the, with the trade circle. Practically, Britain, Dorstad, Ribe, Tunsberg, Britain. Keep doing this circle and you will be swimming in gold, my good sir. Swimming in gold. Uh, for the mercenary route, as, young, as long as you raid shit, you're going to make a lot of money. As long as you raid shit, you're going to make a lot of money. You can even decide to go to a permanent state of war with a faction and just raid their villages up as much as possible. Uh, that's your decision if you want to go to war. Uh, again, very, very... Um, you will receive a lot of goods and a lot of cash for raiding. And uh, selling the equipment at, you know, 
a town or a bandit camp or something like that will give you a lot of money too. Then, once you go and create all of the enterprises, so we're going back to the enterprise subject, once you create enterprises all over the world and you sent out uh, all of your companions to gather right to rule, I do recommend that you visit each village in the game, each village in the game, and buy or convince them to let you recruit from their village permanently. It's a uh, very useful late game when you're gonna be need you're gonna be needing a lot of troops. So do that, good sirs. Um, just pay pay the price. Don't convince lords to don't try to convince lords to give you the right to recruit in their territories because they can always revoke that if you go to war with them. So fuck those guys. Uh, just go ahead and pay the price. Pay the price for it, and you will not have problems with troops ever again. Also, if you uh, a good location for the refugee, for your refugee, uh, the refugee is a good source. It's kind of a mini town, a uh, good source for weapons and training up troops. Uh, build it where you want your fac when you where you want to start your faction from, because you will garrison a lot of troops inside there, and you're going to be using those troops to siege the town. In this case, I build Booty Helm Fortress over here and I siege the doorstead using the troops I garrisoned over there. But we're gonna get that to you late game. Okay, let's see. Do I need to say anything else in for the early game? I wanna check if I'm forgetting anything. Uh, guys, if you feel like I'm forgetting anything, please let me know. But I don't think I... Oh, also, in the early game, you can visit around all of the locations to gather the best armor and weapons, if so you desire. Okay, now, let's get to the mid-game. In the mid-game, you will want to make relations. Make relations with Lord, make friends, um, maybe even join a faction if you so desire. Uh, but one of the best ways of making friends in this mod is not by beating them up. <laughs> Sadly, it's not by beating them up. One of the best ways of making friends is by making quests for them. In Viking Conquest, uh, quests give you increased relation rewards. So for one, uh, for one quest to grab that bandit that ran away and is hiding in a village, a lord can give you, if you complete it, a lord can give you a bonus of up to 15 relations with him. So just do a few quests in the mid-game, do a few quests, join a few factions, make some friends, make some relations. Um, this is also a good time to upgrade your refugee to the max as much as possible. This is also a good time to uh, acquire a fleet. So I think this is the moment where you need to go and grab boosts for your boys because you will be fielding a large army and sometimes you will, let's say, want to invade Denmark or invade Fries or invade Norway and your attacking forces from Britain, you will need a strong fleet. So grab yourself. Around three boosts are fine. If you uh, Three boosts will give you 270 troops. I don't think you'll need more than that. If you want to go overboard, uh, gra grab five boosts. And sweet Jesus, with 450, you can conquer anything. No problem there. Um, that is pretty pretty much for the mid game it's not a lot of stuff to talk about just make relations make relations if you haven't finished certain aspects from the early game finish them now uh if you haven't already this is the time for you to go and grab the best armor and the best weapons in the game because you will need it for the late game okay and then we reach the late game where we have the kingdom the kingdom oh oh before i forget before i forget about the mid game um if you're in the campaign if you're in if you're doing the campaign um as i as i told you guys before once you leave dorstad from the campaign roam the world and do do everything that I mentioned in the early game. So this is the time in the campaign where you need to do everything that I said in the early game. Okay? Um, and... Uh, yes, hello music. Um, 
once you finish all of the other things in the early game and you're still in the campaign, during the mid game, finish the campaign storyline. Uh, if you finish the campaign storyline, you'll be then thrown inside the sandbox mode and you can continue where you left off. Yeah, Chris, I'm almost finished. I still have a few things to do and I'm almost finished. Um, also, in the mid-game, I mentioned that now is the time to upgrade your refugee to the max. To upgrade your refugee, you will need, like Hello Music said, uh, to buy timber and toolkits. Uh, you'll find timber at lumber camps. Um, they're scattered all over the world. Uh, shouldn't be a problem. I think there's a lumber camp over here in the north and Toolkits you'll find them in villages and towns. It's not that hard. You need five of each for each upgrade Yeah, but still even if you don't go to a lumber camp You'll still have a chance of finding timber at a village and you don't need to find timber pallets Any type of timber will work. So just you know just the logs Okay, and once you've done all of this, you finish the campaign, or if you're in Sandbox, you finish upgrading and you made relations. Now we reach the late game where you have to decide where do you want to where do you want to start your kingdom from. Now, I wanted to take Dorstad. Dorstad is the richest town. You'll find out that Dorstad is the richest town in the world. And I have high relations with Dorstad. So I decided to start my faction from here. So, Kingdom, I built my refugee, upgraded to the max, gathered troops inside the garrison, and then I declared war on Dorstad. Well, I didn't declare war, I just started attacking them, and went for it. Uh, this is uh, another thing that's very important in Viking Conquest that's not as important in the other games. If you conquer a town, a castle, or a castle, sorry, if you conquer a town or a castle, you will be faced with swift retaliation from that faction expect 1200 troops at your doorstep trying to fuck you up okay so first step in the late game even before you take your town or um castle is you beat all of the lords up all of the lords in that area up i went ahead and beat up all of the lords just to make them with as small armies as possible and then i attacked dorstad and then i attacked dorstad keep them down because once you take dorstad they will retaliate if they don't have an army they have nothing to retaliate with that's the idea so i took dorstad and then i went ahead and beat them up some more took kenimer and now i'm gonna beat them up some more and i'm gonna take Vles inge and that's going to be it for the faction of Fries. Uh, now I'm just giving an example. This is where I started the kingdom. I'm just going to take, um, I'm going to disband the faction of Fries, and then I'm going to use the peace time to reinforce my kingdom. Hire troops, put them in garrisons, make it, make them self-sufficient. Um, leave one of the fiefs open to attract other lords to your side or lords to your faction assign them fiefs and i noticed that um personalities are not that important in uh personalities are not that important in viking conquest so you just make lords as you see fit okay the only thing that you need to keep in mind is the religion of the lord or something like that um, let me give you another example. Let's say I want to start my faction from Denmark. You take Ribe. Don't go for a castle. I recommend that you take a town as your capital. You take Ribe. Uh, but before you take Ribe, you beat all of the lords up. Just don't give them a chance to retaliate. And then go ahead and take the castle to the south and take the castle to the west. I know, I know Denmark seems bigger than Frisia. But it's not. It still has uh, a town and two castles. Let me just make sure that I say, I'm saying that correctly. Oh, no. My bad. Sorry. A town and three castles. Okay. Yeah. They, they're they bigger with one extra castle than Frisia. So you would take Ribe. You would take the southern castle and then attack and take the northern castles as well. If you want to start from Norway, same thing. Take Tunsberg and then clean up towards the north. If you're in Ireland um, and you want to start in Ireland, I recommend that you start from a corner and go outwards. 
a good chance would be to go take by steel because you're defended by water to the west and there's just one bridge or you could go take uh sail cane it's a peninsula you can easily defend it and just fight on the northern front uh k seal i don't recommend you take k seal maybe take k seal last because k seal has a large area large territory and it's going to be harder to for you to defend uh, another good way of doing things is take a lich you would have just two fronts that you need to defend and attack outwards or you can go, even go for Rathseltair Re and go all horse from there. And now in Britain, again, take a corner. I recommend that you go ahead. From the north, it, there's no good location to start from. If you want to, take uh, take Squin. Eliminate the southern territories of the kingdom of Alban. And then go north from there. If you want to start from the other end, Canterbury is easily defendable. Uh, Bosvenegg is easily defendable. Um, Serdif is easily defendable because it's right on the coast, and again, it's a peninsula. And Dunwick is easily defendable. Very big peninsula. You can attack westwards and a bridges all the way over here, and on the southern front, all the way over here. So, very easily defendable territories over on this side. Uh, that's going to be it for kingdoms. Um, I do recommend that you marry, if you have the opportunity, marry before you create your own kingdom. You know, join a faction and marry a lady. That's going to give you three extra right to rule, but it's really not that important in Viking Conquest. Um, the reason you would want a lady is so you can make, uh, make her your queen, your minister, and to manage the lands with you. I just made Solveig. I just made my companion in Solveig uh, the minister until I decide on marrying a lady. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, and okay, another important topic. I think we have just two more topics that I need to talk about. Uh, guys, if I forget anything, please let me know. Um, but I need to talk about field tactics, uh, battle tactics. So, about soldiers and battle tactics. Uh, the game divides the soldiers into six categories. So you have um infantrymen you have spearmen i know i know they're in the infantry category but if you don't modify this they're in the spear spearman category they're here okay i have infantrymen spearmen archers um where are the skirmishers let me find some skirmishers okay skirmishers cavalry Oh, sorry, cavalry, and these are considered horse archers, but I put them in the cavalry section as well. Um, you don't need the, these all of these types of troops. It makes uh, the battle chaotic and confusing and fucked up. First of all, bring all of the horse archers into the cavalry section. Just have one big cavalry section, because even if they're cavalry, even if they're horse archers, their AI will still prioritize them to throw first and then go into melee later. And then for skirmishers, skirmishers uh, keep them separate. Okay, so for skirmishers, keep them separate from the archers because skirmishers run out of ammo and then you will be able to utilize them as infantry. Weaker infantry than your normal ones, your dedicated ones, but still decent inf infantry nonetheless. So keep the skirmishers apart from the archers. Archers, keep them back, keep them safe, keep them shooting very easy and then we come to the main subject the infantry and the spearmen now there is a formation in viking conquest called shield wall it's a complex formation you press the f4 key you tell them to go into shield wall position very good for your boys shield wall what what does the what the shield wall the formation implies it will put men with shields in the front and we'll put spearmen in the back. That's why it's a very good idea to assign all spearmen, all of them, to be infantry. That way, you can select both in, uh, both the spearmen and infantry into one. You can tell them to form a uh, spear formation, um, sorry, not spear formation, shield wall formation, and they're gonna be fucking unstoppable fucking unstoppable uh the worst thing that you can do in viking conquest is tell your men to charge 
Telling your men to charge him by King Kong was a suicide. Formation is key. Formation is the winner. Uh, so what I recommend that you do, the first thing that you do in each field battle, let me see if I can find a field battle just so I can show you guys. Not that a good idea to go fighting right now. I think I had a field battle if I load back. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go attack those uh, thieving Franks. Start a battle holding position. Oh, and you also have some commander options extra for Viking Conquest. If you have enough leadership, you can go uh, commander options and you can tell your skirmishers to move in and attack the enemy. Uh, this is a dice roll. Sometimes you'll be able to attack the enemy. Sometimes you won't be able to attack the enemy. Or you can also impassion your men with a speech. And again, it's a dice roll. And that can increase your party morale. Always start a battle holding position because your men will go into formation. And this is what you need to do. So as soon as you enter the battle, call in the infantry. Put them in the front. There, if you if you tell them to uh, start a battle holding position, they'll be automatically in uh, shield wall. They're automatically in shield wall position, and tell them formation order. Stand closer two times. And this little formation over here will be the end of the enemy. The end of the enemy. This is your lawnmower. This is your enemy lawnmower. You sim you don't break them for formation. You just tell them to m advance forward or advance backwards. Or you tell the infantry to move like so while within formation. And they will murder everything that comes inside their way. With minimal casualties. This is the way you win Viking Conquest. You keep them in formation, in shield wall, closer to each other two times, archers on one side, skirmishers on the other, and once the enemy breaks, you send in the cavalry that you have to clean up. And that's how you win. That's how you win the battle. If you have a mostly cavalry army, just tell them to charge in. Try to flank the shield, their enemy shield wall from the side, and it's going to be good. It is going to be good and deadly. Hello, Fenrir. Yes, you can also have a doggo. You can also have a doggo. Uh, the doggo is simply kind of a mini horse. Uh, it just staggers the enemy with charge attacks. So that's all, but it's not very effective. It's more of a aesthetic pet. I call them Fenrir. I, for those who know Norse mythology, mythology will know why. Okay, so that is pretty much it for field tactics. That's all you need to know. Oh, and as soon as the skirmishers... Uh, so, no, these are the archers. As soon as the skirmishers run out of ammo, tell them to stand closer as well, and they're going to act as a secondary uh, enemy land mower for you. Okay? They're going to act as a secondary land mower. Okay, shuttle uh, desert is common. I don't really care about this gear. I just wanted to show you guys the battle. Um, anything else? Oh yes, a lot of people will be confused about the shield battle, uh, about the siege mechanic. So sieging in uh, Viking Conquest is a little bit shittier than in the other games because it's a little bit more realistic. Let me show you. I'm just gonna go siege Vlesinga, yeah, even though they have a lot more troops than me right now. So they have 600 troops. I have 229. If I had around 300, 280, I would totally take this castle. No fucks given. You go into the siege the castle, and then you reach a new um, menu. You have some new menu options that you need to utilize. So as you can see, you can't uh, just build a ladder and attack. You need to do some other things. We need to do Siege Warfare. Um, if you want to starve them, yes, yes, there is an option to starve the enemy out. But to do so, you need to build a blockade around the village. Or the, sorry, the castle or the town. Uh, to build a blockade, it will take a certain amount of time. And you need to have at least 250 men in your army. 
Another thing that you need to do is order the construction of sanitation to prevent disease. This shit happens. If you don't build this, this is the first thing that you need to do. If you don't build the sanitation to prevent disease, your enemies can die of plagues and illnesses. Pretty fucking horrible. Once you build the sanitation, if you want to attack as fast as possible, you go to Siege Warfare, preparing the assault. And from here, you need to build mantlets and build equipment and clear the ground for assault. Mantlets will defend the vanguard, the people that go in and put the ladders. And building equipment and clearing the grounds are the ladders themselves. So practically, they're building the ladders too. This will take 12 hours for the ladders. It will take 12 hours for the mantlets. And it will take four hours for the sanitation. That's the fastest way that you can seize your tower. Uh, so imagine that all of the towns, all of the fiefs that you want to conquer, they're the same as as a siege tower from native game or from any other mod that will take 48 hours to get. And think of it this way. I have engineering 9 on one of my companions and it still takes this much time. Still takes this much time. You can also pillage farms to replenish your stocks and harm the enemy in case um, in case you run out of food. But this is going to decrease the relations with the, uh, the town you're going to be conquering. And so on and so forth. You can call a meeting with the castle commander if you want to ask them to surrender. That's good if they don't have a lot of food. And that's it. That's it for the sieges and the siege mechanics. Also... Most of the times you will want to charge in as soon as possible inside sieges because you usually just have to go over a bridge or something like that. Some sieges don't even have ladders in them, so you'll just have to charge in directly. Infantry is king. Infantry is king in Viking Conquest. Um, what else? I think that's pretty much it. Now I just need to talk about some of the mechanics and the difficulty options that you can go for inside the game. Um, let me see. We'll talk about wounds in a second. Uh, I don't need to talk about quarters. I do want to talk about the options the difficulty options okay this is going to be the last subject i hope i'm not forgetting anything uh the last subject will be difficulty i went with everything on normal so i reached this point with everything on normal recruitment is on normal difficulty at beginner levels um you simply don't have to pay at beginner levels, you simply don't have to pay um, the villagers to recruit. So if you don't want to hassle through the Viking mechanic of recruiting, press beginner and you'll be able to recruit like in vanilla. Okay, I just went with the normal option just to see if it's worth doing and if it's doable. It is. Uh, leveling. <clears throat> Uh, simply, this um, shows you the how, how hard it is to train up troops. I would just leave this on normal, um, but you're not going to be leveling up a lot of troops. On beginner, it's just like in vanilla or in on the other mod where it's a little bit easier to level up troops. Uh, budget. <coughs> uh, this is, it all depends on uh, the loot that you get from monasteries it, and it also decreases if you play it on a beginner it decreases the cost wages of your troops okay so just keep it on normal in my opinion if you want the viking conquest experience if you are a um if you are a uh, masochist put everything on hardcore and have fun i'm not i just want the game to be fun uh player damage and friend damage you we have the normal options like in any other game normal easy and easiest so if you want to have a good time but also you're you fear for your life if you die in battle go with the middle option go with easy um on normal a random random javelin goes through your shield and kills you have fun have fun if you just want to watch your troops fight without you then sure go on normal difficulty i recommend that you go with the middle ground Okay, combat AI, I put it on hardcore. Combat AI simply decides um, the AI combat of the units. Put it on hardcore, this affects everyone. Everyone. I like it on hardcore because it's 
fucking awesome. Tactical speed, bes- um, so tactical speed will determine the speed of auto calculation in battle, but it'll also determine the speed of your units and the enemy units on the field of battle. Uh, since uh, Viking Conquest is very infantry intensive, I recommend you put this on fastest. If you have a lot of mounted units, you can put this on normal. If you have a lot of archers and you want time to decide through the battle, put it on slowest. I keep it on fastest. Campaign AI. Okay. Campaign AI, I put it on beginner because campaign AI is the same like all of the other mods in vanilla. It is unfair if you put it on normal or hardcore. It will simply decide how fast the troops replenish their armies. It did not. De- it does not determine their um, tactical decisions. They will not flank you. They will not cut your supply lines. They will not ambush you more or stuff like that. It will only affect how fast they replenish their troops. It will, as you can see there, it affects the size of the battle, the renown loss in battle, chances of recruiting lords taxes how lords get reinforcements and if it's on uh, normal or hardcore it it's unrealistic how lords get reinforcements think of it like this you beat a lord of 100 troops he returns with 200 or 250 good luck with that not fun not fun at all batted parties keep them on normal um this is going to be a good income if you go for the raider route and then stamina it's a cool feature. Um, stamina will simply determine if your troops get tired or not. It also determines your character if he gets tired or not. I keep this active. Uh, gear effect skills. Keep this on because it will balance the game out. If you have this deactivated, uh, the high-end troops, the armored troops are practically broken and OP and you won't be able to fight them in the early game. So... Again, if you deactivate this and gear doesn't affect skills, good luck. Shield Bash, I hate this mechanic. Uh, I just keep it deactivated because I usually like to go... Once I block, I like to go for a quick swing counterattack. If I have Shield Bash active, <laughs> it will do an automatic Shield Bash, and I hate Shield Bash. That's why I have it deactivated, but again, this is your choice. Wounds, I keep this on. So, if you receive a critical hit um, from the enemy, and yes, you can do critical hits if you attack from behind or... If you attack from the side, from the flank, you can do extra bonus damage. If you receive uh, critical hits, or there is a small percent chance that you will receive a wound, a wound will decrease one of your main attributes. Strength, agility, uh, charisma, intellect. I think I think it doesn't decrease your intellect, but it, it, it decreases the, the rest of them. If you have a wound on yourself, you need to go to the town and talk with a physician to heal you up. And wounds heal up over time. For example, let me go to my character. And I had 10 wounds in my lifetime. If you don't heal up your, if you don't visit a physician in five days after you receive the wound, it will become a permanent scar on your character. And that minus one to strength, minus one to agility, or minus one to charisma will be permanent. For the love of God, go and visit your your local doctor if you're not feeling well, okay? But I like to have it on. It's realistic. It's pretty fucking awesome. Um, blood loss. If you're, if you're low on health, you're going to bleed out. It's almost over this. This is the last subject. Um, if you... If you have... If you're low on health, you'll bleed out and you'll die. I have a lot of battles where I'm low on health and I just... just with the skin of my teeth, I'm almost winning, but if you have Blood Loss active, you won't be able to do those cheeky killing five people before you go down. You'll just go down for Blood Loss, so that's kind of fucked up. I, that's why I have it deactivated. And then uh, Damageable Equipment. This will take into consideration the Weapon Maintenance feature. Your uh, equipment can... Uh, ruin themselves, and to repair them, you just need to go to a town... Uh, okay, Hero Chief, welcome to the end, good sir. 
um, you'll need to go to one of the armor smiths or weapon smiths to repair the equipment. This is going to cost money and you already need a lot of money in the game to invest in a lot of other stuff. Fuck, even upgrading troops costs around 300 depending as a soldier. So I'm just going to deact. Um, I'm going to leave the damageable equipment deactivated because I want the extra cash. Rest improves on morale. I keep this on or off. It really doesn't matter. Battle size. Um, keep this on 300. Keep this on 300. This is a good sweet spot. If you go beyond 300, you're going to have a lot of FPS issues. Uh, disable the scenic menu. You don't need to look at the pretty menu. Um, the pretty menu loads for a long time. Just disable it. You can go for insane difficulty if you are, as I said, um, very, very... If you love pain, the enemies will cause double damage while you only do half damage. Why would you do that? Why? Do you like being unconscious and let your troops do all of the work for you? Sure. Go for insane difficulty if you want to. I don't. Uh, gore. Pretty cool. Adds decapitation to the battle. Um, you can also replace music in battle. Again, you can disable music and add more ambient sounds for realistic purposes. Player division is meh. Disable complex formation so you won't be able to uh, go into shield wall or ranks or stuff like that. Shield wall and ranks are your bread and butter in battle. Keep the com the complex formations on. Keep also keep this auto turn army to face the enemy. You will always be facing the enemy. You will decrease the chance of receiving flanks, uh, flanking attacks from the enemy if you keep this on. And players enemies only attack if you want easy mode and if you want the enemy uh, the enemy AI to not use tactics at all in battle. Turn this on. I recommend against it because. It's awesome to see a shield wall on shield wall action gone sexual. I just like that shit. Uh, more options. You can go for total cheat menu. And the last options are from uh, the options menu, the damage, the difficulty settings. Again, they're the same as in the other options. Everything is on easy, the in between between normal and easiest. Lance control, I put it on hard. And. Combat speed on fastest with the battle size up to 300. Around that ballpark. Sometimes I, I hit 300 on the head. But again, this is a good balance between easy and hard. So for those who like to play hardcore, please up those settings and have fun. For those who want an easier time, bring them down. It doesn't matter. Play the game as you enjoy it. Okay? It's, it's very important that you play the game as you enjoy it. And I think... That's gonna be it for that. Oh, I did want to mention, since uh, Hero Chief mentioned about naval battles, I will go to one of my ship, to one of my ships. You will learn how to utilize ships in, uh, in the campaign. And early game, when you don't have a ship, you can go to any port city and ask for passage for a few cash. That's why I mentioned that it's a good idea to keep a small army on you in the early game as possible. Um, oh, before that, miscellaneous, you can also hunt animals, um, use a spear, or scare the animals and they will attack you and use a sword. In Dorstad, let's just go set sail. So I have my fleet with me. I have five ships or four ships, something around that ballpark. If I attack these traders, now I'm just going to show you, um, for the sake of it, how to control your ships. Okay, board the enemy. So you control your ship. You first press backspace to give you a high view of your ship. These are all of my ships. You press up, down, left, right to control your ship. In the top right corner, you'll also see be able to see the wind. You can bring up out of the sails by pressing enter. You can go back to um, rowing by pressing enter again. And up, down, left, right from the arrow keys on the right side of the keyboard. You can control with the ACDW keys. If you do that, you're going to move your character on the ship, as you can see. To go back into... Uh, to go back into ship view, press backspace. Okay, let me just switch off from this ship. Good. And let's go board the enemy. To board a ship, you just have to hit it. Just have to ram it. Sadly, there's no ramming damage or stuff like that. 
uh, you just have to go near it and they'll automatically board themselves. As you can see, those ships have hit. Now they're gonna go next to each other automatically and the combat will start. If you have a lot of archers, you can also just roam around the ships and shoot from there and you're gonna be okay. So that's how naval battle works. Also, once the enemies from a ship are all dead, the ships will automatically detach themselves. Make sure you're not on the wrong ship when that happens. Okay, and these guys are... Okay, this other ship is retarded. The AI is not very good. So keep that in mind. But the boys are battling away. Oh, and even if you have maximum amount of surgery, you will still get casualties. It's inevitable in Viking Conquest. Oh, and you don't have to worry about formations in naval battle. Just get near the ships and fight as much as possible. Okay. Is there another ship on that side? Sure. Let's just finish the battle. Um, That is pretty much it for the Viking Conquest Guide. Hope all of the information helped. If I forget something... Yes, how can you acquire the dog? Uh, you can acquire the dog by searching in the village. Ask the village leaders... Oh, fuck. Oh, and if you fall in uh, the water, you go unconscious directly. There. If... Um, you just go to the villages, ask for the village leader for if they saw a dog in the area. If they did, they will say they did. You need to have a sausage in your inventory to feed the dog, and then the dog will join your army, join your forces. And that is it for my Viking Conquest guide. Uh, the last thing that I just don't know about that I need to check out is need to figure out what's with the ancient stones. I'm going to mention this in one of the comments below as soon as I release the video. Okay. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, hit me uh, with the comments or you can find me on stream. I stream from uh, Monday to Friday, seven hours a day uh, from 11 a.m. East European Standard Time. That would be... Um, I really, really need to figure out uh, how much is that in East Standard Eastern Standard Time for America. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it. If um, you want to find me on stream, there's a link in the description below. Hit that follow button if you like this video. It makes the video um, be recognized by YouTube. If you didn't like it, hit that dislike button. It also helps me out. And uh, please leave your feedback, leave your questions in the description below. Hope you enjoyed it. You'll find the timestamps of all of the topics in the description of the video. And that's it. I wish you guys a wonderful, wonderful day. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, so it's around 3 a.m. Eastern Time. And I usually, okay, got it. Thanks, my dude. Thank you. Now I just need to write here, uh, two minutes, 30 minutes. Okay, whoo, and that's done. That was.